Yes. Well, your latest to premiere at Venice yes. was obviously The Whale. Yeah. And got, you know, massive standing ovation. And yeah. that meme that went around with <laughs> Brendan Fraser uh, too. Choked up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, it was My amazing. first meme ever. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> was, uh, it, I had like weird childhood friends being like, I saw you in the background. Are you involved with this? <laughs> it was oh, very funny. Fun. She saved him. She wasn't trying to hurt him. She was trying to help him. Who are you talking about? He's going home. She did that. Charlie. She didn't do it to hurt him. She did it to send him home. Do you feel lightheaded, Charlie? Look at me. She's trying to help him. Who? Ellie. She was trying to help him. She just wanted to send him home. Do you ever get the feeling that people are incapable of not caring? People are amazing. Welcome to Behind the Lens. Uh, today, well, you know his films. Uh, there are a multitude since, I think, 25 years you've been uh, directing movies <laughs> since Pi. Uh, and this year alone, director and producer of The Whale, producer of The Good Nurse, and producer of the documentary The Territory, too. You're a busy guy. Welcome, yeah. Darren Aronofsky. Thank you for having <laughs> me. Thanks for having me. Well, The Whale is an extraordinary movie, and like so many movies, took a long time and a <laughs> very long journey to get to the screen. Yeah. And, and this is one that you have directed as well as produced. Did you yeah. always start out intending to direct when you got the rights to this play? Yeah, I think m most projects that are feature films that I get involved with start off with something that I feel deeply because I know they're going to take a long time. There's been certain projects that I haven't follow followed through all the way and other directors have come on like Pablo Lorraine with Jackie. Right. Um, but the Whale, when I saw it 10 years ago, I was just so deeply moved uh, as, a, as a play by these characters that on the surface seemed so different from me. Yeah. But as the play unfolded, I just connected with them in such a deep way. They broke my heart by the end <laughs> of it. Uh, and I just was like, that's, that's the gift of cinema is when you can watch a movie on a character that you seem to like have no connection to but right. be sucked into their world and uh, just have a, this incredible journey that you realize, oh wow, I understand them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it about it? You saw the play. I mean, yeah. you were sort of like first one in on yeah. this and uh, discovered it. And what made it, yeah. what made you think you could make this a cinematic? Because it's very cinematic, even though yeah. it's basically on one set. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. My, my mentor, Stuart Rosenberg, a great director, did Cool Hand Luke. Did you ever meet him? Back I in the did. Day? Yeah, I yeah. actually interviewed him oh, did you? once on the phone. Yeah. Oh, amazing. It was so great. He's a yeah. great character, great, great human. <laughs> He's not Rue a Baker and yeah, exactly. else he did. And uh, just filled with wisdom. I got. He taught me at the AFI for a year. Oh, and wow. It was, a, it was a real blessing. And um, he would talk about the theater as um, kind of like a, taking a slice out of a cake mm -hmm. and looking at the inside of the cake, but that a movie is different that you're inside the cake. Right. And I guess that's reflected very much in when my production designers came up with the idea of sticking the couch in the center of the room, which was kind of a radical idea because normally a couch is against the wall. Yeah. <laughs> but what it allowed me is suddenly to stick Charlie, the main character, who's not very mobile, in the center of the set. The 600 pounds. Yes, yeah. and, let every, and let all the other actors block and rotate around him and it suddenly I was inside that cake and um, that I think was the kind of moment where I realized okay this can be this this I think is, is cinema that's what it really works too mm -hmm. when I saw the picture I noticed the actors and they're great actors not yep. just Brendan Fraser who yep. 
is uh, the main character, Charlie, but all these women yeah. in it, too, in his life, each one of them is great. And when I watch Samantha Morton, who plays his ex-wife, <laughs> sort of come in yeah. and make it move and yeah. just, like, take over, but make that space come alive for her. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's an interesting, uh, <laughs> that, that triggers a really interesting story, which is, I knew, because we were super low budget film, right. that I needed three and a half weeks of rehearsal. Yeah. So luckily, the producers and myself as a producer, <laughs> we, we made that happen uh, and we taped out the set. Uh, we didn't have enough money to have doubles of anything, so the couch was just a bunch of boxes. Yeah. Um, but I stuck the actors in there and we blocked out the whole thing. But since it was during COVID and Samantha Morton was in the UK, we couldn't get her over back and forth. So she would have to come when we started shooting. And so we used another actor to play her and to block it out. Okay. And I knew <laughs> that when Sam came, it was gonna, the, the whole set would have to be reinvented for her. And she did exactly that because she is, everything has to come from a real place. So she's like, no, I wouldn't walk over there. I wouldn't, and she had to make it each. And luckily I've, I've I have the experience to know this is gonna be much better once she gets her hands dirty and yeah and sure enough that that's what happened but you made it yourself confident in it by having that rehearsal is rehearsal yeah. really important for you on these films you find with the actors that you have coming in here a movie like this absolutely because yeah. um the blocking had to be constantly dynamic to keep it interesting because right. i i had very little else to work with i had one room and i just basically had the text and the performers and the blocking yeah. uh and how i used the camera to tell the story once again Stuart rosenberg would say there's in every scene there's only one place to put the camera. And that really stuck with me over the years was like, okay, my job as a director is to look at the scene and by whatever the scene is about and the thematics of the movie, I have to figure out where to put the camera. Like the classic being, you know, the horror film for Frankenstein is down here, <laughs> or if you want the God I view from above, that's yeah. the most basic. But you can really help a performer uh, and the text by using the camera. So. A very early blocking thing was when Ellie, when Sadie Sink's character comes in and she's sort of taunting um, Charlie by being behind him. I always knew this idea of like kind of a camera kind of behind him with him struggling to sort yeah. of catch her. And it sort of sets up her character being kind of cruel to him mm -hmm. and his character struggling with his limited movement. Yeah. How did you come upon his casting? Because yeah. he hadn't been front of mind in movies for a while. You know, this was what you did with Mickey Rourke, too, yeah. in The Wrestler. You know, a Very, great actor, you bring them back in the right kind of role. Very different. You know, the Mickey thing was all, um, you know, we wrote The Wrestler. Rob Siegel wrote The Wrestler with the perception of Mickey in mind. I, I big, huge fan as a kid and wanted to see him see what he could do. Um, but it was very different in this process. I, I, I got the rights about 10 years ago for Sam. We worked on the script, but there was Sam never- Sam Hunter is the Sam Hunter, writer, yes, and wrote sorry. the play. Uh, yeah, he wrote the play, and then I asked him to write the screenplay because it was so personal, so autobiographical that I was like, no, no one else should touch this. You, you have to learn the medium of, of screenwriting, right. <laughs> and we'll help you with my company. And, uh, and you know, try to give you some wisdom, which he really took to, but um, you're the one who has to do this. No one else should touch your words. Um, but over the 10 years that I had it, there was never an actor that got me excited to really do this. I thought of everyone in different ways <laughs> thinking about it, but none of it really kind of clicked or made sense. Um, and then I saw the trailer of a kind of low budget um, Brazilian movie and he had a supporting role, Brendan, and a light bulb went off. And I said, what about that guy? <laughs> and I, to be really transparent, I didn't really know any of his uh, work that much. The I mean, I had, seen, I had seen The Mummies, <laughs> but I hadn't seen George of the Jungle or Encino Man. And I had seen none of the dramatic work. I hadn't seen right. Gods and Monsters or School Ties. Um, but it was a real gut feeling of like mm -hmm. this guy, we never thought about him and I have, you know, once a movie star, always a movie star. But like the best part of that <laughs> is he's a movie star that hasn't shown his goods in a long time. Right. Like a lot of movie stars that you see so much of them that you're like, okay, <laughs> I get I get what they're gonna do. Yeah. You know, not all of them are Meryl Streep. <laughs> every, every every performance is different. Yeah. And so I was excited by that. And then he came into my office in Chinatown and it just he was, besides being an utter gen gentleman, 
it was just clear he had a lot to give yeah. and that had, he hadn't been given the opportunity to show it and he wanted to. And I love actors that are hungry and they want to work and they want right. to do the work. I, a lot of actors that are successful, <laughs> they forget acting class. Uh -huh. <laughs> when they wanted to cry, when they wanted right. to scream, when they wanted to do Stella, Stella, <laughs> you know, they forget about that. Yeah. Um, but Brendan wanted to work and that, yeah. that's, that's exciting for me. You know, when I look at your list of films here, beginning in 98 with Pi, and then, of course, Requiem for a Dream, and The Fountain, The Wrestler, Black Swan, for which you got all those Oscar nominations mm -hmm. and everything else, Noah, and Mother, as you know, I was a big fan of Mother. Good. It got an F cinema score. Does Love that it. bother you that ah. the audience goes? <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's not really a judgment of the film. It's how yeah. the film was released and what people were expecting and, and stuff. And maybe the audience that should have been there. Yeah. Yeah, I think, look, I think it was, uh, it was a, really con it's a really different type of movie. Yeah. And it was a very hard thing to figure out how to get it out into the world. Yeah. Um, but, look, I, the response I get from that film... It's just crazy. It, it would have it, to you know, be. Yeah. Critically, it was very well received. Yeah. But and now people are coming back and they're doing, it's, it, uh, you know, I got, I get cornered by people that just go on for 40 minutes about the film. And the same thing happened with The Fountain. Which yeah, was well, also, that one yeah, too. Yeah. That one also. Yeah. I, I just love that movie. And yeah. I, I actually Critics beware. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you know. Well, I believe that. I mean, I love it. I like Rex Reed, uh, Bless His Soul was like, this is not the worst film of the year, it's the worst film of the century <laughs> about, about Mother. Yeah. And I was like, How you know, long does he spend trying to come up with those I love it, lines? I love it, I love it, I love it. I mean, it hurts, but it's like, what are you gonna do? You just keep doing it, whether it's 25-year-old movies <laughs> or new movies. I wanna mention The Good Nurse, which you know I loved, and, and uh, I saw and I knew yeah. nothing about, and I sat there by myself right across the street here at the Sepulveda screening room. It's pretty and surprising, right? It just blew me away. I'm yeah. going like, I kept talking back to the screen. I'm by myself <laughs> in this little screening room, but That's the it really is great. And you're a yeah. producer there, and you're yeah. giving this opportunity as a first English language film to, to Tobias, Tobias, Tobias uh, Lindholm. Yeah. And, um, you know, how does that come about as a producer? You know, you decide, I'm going to do this kind of movie now. So, so my company, Protozoa, that's kind of one of the businesses we've been good at is like, identifying um, great international filmmakers that want to do something in English for the first time. We did it with <laughs> Pablo, Pablo Lorraine right. and Jan Damage with White Boy Rick and now Tobias. And um, that's just fun. It's, it's, um, it's, it's often material that I've been thinking about considering, but for some reason doesn't match up. Good Nurse, um, Ari Handel in my office discovered the book. We thought, this is like the craziest story that no one really knows that right. kind of the most uh, prolific serial killer of all time and no one's made a film about the nurse who captured him it's a crazy story so we started developing the script and um, and then eventually we found Tobias and Jessica came on and Eddie Redmayne I mean talk about dream casting yeah and uh, and, and uh, I think it actually did really well for Netflix so I that's think great. so too yeah. yeah it was like you know they put out they don't tell you everything. When they tell you anything, it's good news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they told us a lot. So they, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, good. That's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's good to have good news, yeah, especially exactly. if you're Darren Aronofsky. And, you <laughs> thank know, you. You've got all these projects. Uh, well, thank you for joining us on Behind thank the you, Lens. Thank you, as always. Best of luck on all of this. Thanks. Thank you.